My name is Norm Brown. I'm a retired deputy chief with CAL FIRE in the Mendocino unit in Northern California. I have over 34 years in the fire service upon retirement. I've also been burning, conducting my own control burns for uh, about 30 years or so on my own private property. And we'll be discussing fire in the North Coast Chaparral. Why do we have a need in the North Coast Chaparral for burning? Well, I think one of the main reasons would be fuel reduction. Anytime you break up the age class of the brush, break up the, the continuity of the fuel, you're gonna modify the fire behavior and hopefully decrease some of these extreme fire behavior and extreme burning conditions. Another component is to restore fire back into the ecosystem as a natural component. Studies have shown that fire in the California fire region is anywhere from a six to 20 year recurrence. With that comes the wildlife habitat enhancement. We can also end up with an improved range for livestock. And studies have also shown an improved soil to water relationship. Um, I've seen in areas where I've burned on my own property where springs that were no longer pumping water out of the ground after a burn start pumping water out of the ground. And what are some of the other components? Another need would be to tackle the conifer encroachment. Conifers are encroaching on the grass woodland and they're also encroaching on the chaparral fuels. And so an, another component would be to lessen the conifer encroachment. What fuels are we targeting? Basically the old, old growth Climax chaparral, which mainly comprises of chemise brush, scrub oak, Ceanothus and Manzanita. Those would be the, the main brush species that are targeted. Pictured here is a classic example of chaparral. Primary species in there would be Ceanothus and chemise brush with some live oak. This picture here is taken east of Ukiah in Bureau of Land Management property. Pictured here is chemise brush and notice the red tint on the photograph on the right and the left. When chemise ends up getting that red tint to it, which is usually later in the year, around July, it starts reddening up. That's usually a good sign that the fuel moistures have dropped and it is reaching its critical fuel moistures of uh, 60%. Pictured here is manzanita. There are a couple different species of manzanita that can be targeted. Manzanita itself is fairly difficult to burn, but when it's in a mixture of chaparral, ceanothus, chemise brush, it'll burn quite readily. A picture of ceanothus, also known as blue blossom, and there's a number of species of ceanothus. And we'll get into project considerations. When you meet with a landowner, what are you going to be looking for? One, one thing to look for is access for equipment and personnel. You have a good road system, can you get the folks in their roads in good enough shape to get your equipment that you need in there, fire engines, bulldozers, pickup trucks, crew buses if you're working for an agency. Another good consideration to think about is communicating with fire agencies. If you're working for an agency, that's usually going to be done. However, if you're burning on your own as a private landowner, it's very prudent to talk with your fire agencies. That will lessen the calls. When they do get calls to their dispatch center, they're going to know that you're burning and lessen any anxieties that folks have just by some simple communication. Another good factor is to communicate with your joining landowners. One good way to lessen your, your relationship with your landowners is to not let them know when you're burning. And most of the time, depending on the area, a lot of your landowners will want to join in. Also think about what permits might be needed from your local fire department to the state agencies to the federal agencies. Most air quality management districts will be wanting a smoke management plan if you're burning over 10 acres. Another factor to think about when putting on a burns is having a, do you have enough equipment available? Do you have enough fire engines? Do you have enough crews, enough personnel available? If uh, in an area that's surrounded by high population, sometimes it's good to put out a press release and let people know that there'll be a burn taking place so it lessens the anxiety when, when the smoke and lessens the calls that come into a um, ECC, a command center. All right, let's talk about pre-burn preparation. Do you need control lines or do you not need control lines? Control lines burning, burning in the chaparral fuels, depending on the time of year, which we will discuss later, are not always required. However, it is nice to, when planning a burn, to incorporate roads or existing control lines. The control lines you use, dozer lines, old dozer lines can be rehabilitated and put back into use. One thing about dozers is they're hard on the land. 
Hand line's another component that you can use. Much less impact on the, on the land, very little disruption to the bare soil. Do you need to do any road improvement to get any equipment in there? Another good reason for having your control lines is to keep any fire out of the other property boundaries. And, and if your burn unit is gonna be buttoned up against private property that's not on the on burn unit and they don't want any fire in there, it's best to have some type of a fire break in there. It's also very critical to know the project boundaries. And if you do not know the property boundaries, there are certain ways to do that now. Um, there's some good programs out there, some GPS chips that show all the property lines because in, in the wildlands in that chemise brush, there might not be fences or not, might not be roads. It's just an arbitrary line that's on a map and it doesn't show on the hillside. So it's very important to know the project boundaries. Also, know the burn units. If you're going to have folks helping you on the fire, such as division supervisors, you're going to have another burn boss, anybody else, any engine crews, take the time. If you know you're going to burn a couple weeks in advance, take the time, get your folks out there, get them familiar with the property, get them familiar with the burn units, let them orientate so that they have the plan and it's not a surprise the morning they go out there to try to do a burn and they got to try to figure it out. And as that last statement says, have a burn boss, part of the planning phase, bring them in early, get them out there early, have them orientate, look over the burn units so that they can put in their plan into play directly on the day of the burn and not have to figure it out. Another big component, and take this from experience, ensure any infrastructure will not be harmed. Okay, that may sound like any big deal, it's just a bunch of brush country, but <clears throat> you never know where there might be fiber optic lines buried, look for power lines running across canyons and through the brush, look for phone lines running through the brush, look for any, if there's any type of infrastructure on top of a hillside, any type of communications equipment. A couple of years ago, and this is from experience, we did a control burn on the east side of Ukiah on some private property that had some communications equipment on it. We thought we had it fairly well cleaned up, but we did not realize there was a coax cable running through the brush to a piece of equipment that we could not see. We ended up burning this coax cable up, which put some local TV channels out in the Ukiah area for about five days. So take the time, make sure that you've protected all infrastructure and you've taken mitigations that, that will fix that. Also, make sure that there, if there's any water lines, uh, springs developed that run to any infrastructure, they're usually ran with plastic pipe, and make sure that any water infrastructure won't be damaged either. Attached here is a little example, a little video of burning in the chaparral. Primary species being targeted here is some east breast with a little bit of ceanothus, some scrub oak, however the scrub oak wasn't burning too much on this particular day, and then within the chemise brush was some manzanita burning. Burn was conducted in March 2019. You can see in the background there's some strips that were already burned. Note that the fire will burn up to the top of the ridge and goes out. On this particular example there is a road at the top and a road at the bottom. However, there's virtually no downhill progression of fire. What equipment do you need to, to conduct these burns? Conducting these burns is fairly simple as far as equipment goes. Firing equipment, your main equipment will be the drip torch. And the drip torch, you want to mix about 60% diesel, 40% gasoline. And if you're doing hand burns, that'll be the tool of choice. If you have access to a Terra torch, if you go on the back of a pickup, there's many models to choose from now. There's some that go on ATVs or UTVs. It usually shoots out a, a nice stream of fire and you can reach hard to get areas. Excellent tool. If you're working it for an agency, one of the primary tools will be the helicopter with a helitorch on it. And most of these torches now carry about 120 gallons or so of fuel and they're a great way to cover a lot of territory and steep rugged ground and very heavy fuels where people just cannot get into. One thing that I have found, there are other firing devices out there, such as um, hand fire devices, fusees, the aerial ignition balls. However, during the time of year we're talk, we're, that we will talk about later, a burning, 
which is primarily from late October to the end of April. I've not had very good luck using the aerial ignition device balls or fusees. And as we mentioned before, timing of the burn, burn window. What time of year are we talking about? Well, it's been my experience burning in the chaparral fuels. My rule of thumb is anywhere from the end of October to the end of April. Now the conditions will justify and warrant when you start. If you get some rains, the weather's cool, anywhere from mid-October to late October, you might be able to start. However, if you get weather forecasts and it's turning hot and dry, you may want to hold off. In my experience, the best times to start looking at burning in the chaparral fuels is uh, roughly mid-November till the end of April. If we burn a little bit later in the year, into May, or if we start earlier, holding conditions become an issue. During the conditions in November through April, there's virtually no holding issues whatsoever and no mop-up involved. Late spring, once we start getting into May, late May, a lot of the fuel moisture starts coming up. You'll notice blooming and new growth coming on the brush. Well, that's going to mean that your, your live fuel moistures are coming up quite high. What's the best time of day to burn? Well, we all know that your burn conditions anywhere from noon on are, are optimal, just like in fire season. I never even attempt to burn anymore until it's noon or later. That's once the, the normal winds will start. You'll get your normal patterns. It's the lowest humidity and it's had the sun on it the longest. When do you want to start stop your burning in the afternoon? Well, I would burn as long as you have decent burn conditions and your air quality and your fire department allow you to do so. If it's burning at five o'clock in the afternoon and it's burning to your objective, then I would suggest continue burning. Another key factor is the number of days since the last rain. I've been using a rule of thumb for a number of years now, primarily from November into March, and I count 10 days from the last rain. Once I hit that 10-day window, I will look at burning. If there's a forecasted storm coming in in a day or two, I'll wait till just before that storm's gonna come in. If there's no storm forecasted, then I'll wait another week or so. The drier, the better in the months of November through March. I have burned at times, depending on the conditions, of five to six days of dry weather, but oftentimes that's just not optimal. And, if you, and you can only burn on the very south, southwest facing slopes that get the most sunshine. In April, I've sped that up also to a five or six day window. If I get five days, six days of, of dry weather after a rain and it looks like another rain might be coming in and that's my only window, I'll give it a shot. Once April comes, you have the longer days, more sun on everything, you have a longer drying period, usually a little bit more wind at that time of year. And I've had some optimal burns on a five to six day rule of thumb, mainly in April. What's the best fuel moistures? 12 to 15% for dead fuel, if you have the ability to check. 60 to 80% for live fuel moisture. In the chaparral fuels, for me, they usually go dormant for most of the winter. So that the low live fuel moistures stay about the same. They come up a little bit, um, but then start picking back up in, in April and, and uh, really take a jump in, in May and confect your burns if you decide to burn in May. But the lower the live fuel moistures, the better. What about air temperature? Some of the best burns we've had is when we call what's, we get an Arctic blast that comes down, get some cold morning temperatures of uh, 30 degrees or less seems to draw out the moisture. And by the time we want to burn, it's usually in the 40s to 90 degrees, depending on the time of the year. Humidity has a bigger factor that time of year, I think, than, than the actual temperature. I burn just fine with 50, 55 degree temperatures. If you're doing a burn plan, you might have a prescription. You want to be very, fairly careful if you start getting lower than 20% humidity. So 25 to 35, I'd say would be optimal but I've also had, it, had luck burning with 60% humidity, maybe even greater than that, especially if I get a little bit of wind just ahead of a front. If your humidity starts rising and, you, and you're not meeting your objectives in your burn, then you might wanna just go ahead and call, call the burn and, and come back at a later day. Wind, it's one of the biggest factors influencing your fire. Three to 10, I found to be optimal, just enough to get the fire moving, get up the hill, but not enough to really blow the fire all over the place. Anytime you start getting wind gusts of 15 or greater, I would use caution and maybe look at potentially shutting your burn down. But three to 10 miles per hour, I found to be optimal. Anything less than three, unless it's a very steep slope and you're getting 
terrain driven fire, it's hardly worth burning in the chaparral fields. You, you need a little bit of wind to push the fire through the brush. A few factors to consider. Slope. Steeper the better. Fire is going to be slope driven. Your aspect. And again, the time of year that we're talking about burning is November through April for the most part. You're going to need aspects of a south-southwest that gets the most sun, the most heating, and will dry the quickest. And this is primarily where you find your chaparral fuels anyway. Alignment with the wind. You may need to be mobile and move to different burn units. You might be planning on burning burn unit A on any given day, but the particular day you don't have the right winds for it, so you might need to go to burn unit B. It might be aligned better with the wind to get, it, get a better burn to meet your objectives. Again, in these fuels, you might or might not need control lines. In this picture that's on your screen here, you can see roads, dozer lines in the fuels there. That's outstanding to have. You can keep your fire within those, those brush fields. However, during the time of the year that we're talking, fire will burn up to the top of the ridge, hit the top of the ridge, slough over a little bit in the brush fuel, and go out with virtually no progression downhill. Again, it's all about the objectives, how close your property lines are, if you need to keep your fire out of any type of infrastructure or private property. All right, let's get into the burning part. Okay, burning with control lines at the top of the ridge. If needed, and you have the control lines, it's usually best to start at the top, depending on the conditions. Burn along the top, maybe give yourself a little bit of a buffer, make yourself a nice black line, and then you can drop off and take a big bite and let some head fire run towards your control lines. Always be looking for slope, the steeper the better. And any, any slope driven with a slight wind is going to push your fire right through there just nicely. 95% or more of the time, in my experience, burning in the chaparral fuels during the burn window we're talking about, and that's November through April, you get virtually no downhill progression of fire and virtually very little lateral movement of fire also left to right. It pretty much burns in strips up to the top and it burns where you, you light it on the bottom and that's where you get your progression to the left and the right. Note in these pictures, there's a old dozer line at the top of the ridge. You have some primarily chemise and ceanothus fuels. Fire is lit a few hundred feet off the top of the ridge, makes a run to the top, hits the dozer line, and then goes out. Note that there's no, virtually no left to right lateral movement and no downhill movement of the fire. Okay, burning with no control lines. Again, the top picture, some fire lit below the top of a peak and the top of a ridge. Heavy chemise, ceanothus, with some other fuel model or brush models in there. Note the line, the line of demarcation where the fire was lit. This fire here was lit in February. Note that there's no downhill progression of fire, puts up a good black column of smoke, some good fuel, some good flame lengths in there. It's gonna to burn to the top of the ridge and it's gonna go out. And there's a picture of the same area afterwards. After ignition, the fire made a, a nice run, cleaned the brush off nicely, and laid down, went out, and, and there's absolutely no progression downhill. There's no issues with control, no issues with mop-up. In another hour, there won't be a smoke on this thing. Okay, here's another video. Uh, this video would be April of 2019. Very heavy, decadent old chemise brush with a lot of conifer encroachment, uh, part of the objective was to burn some of the conifers also. Best guess on this particular fuel model here, it hadn't burned in at least 50 years that the landowner has had the property, and my guess would be 75 or more years since a fire had burned through this particular area. Note the flame lengths, fires pushes uphill, and again, no progression downhill. Okay, here's a little clip. This is a picture of some primarily manzanita fuel. Was able to get this burned in March of 2019 after only about seven days of dry weather. It's relatively flat terrain compared to a lot of the area in this, in this burn unit. Fire had probably not been in this area for probably 15 years or so. Had a pretty good little wind on it, uh, about 10 to 15 miles an hour, which pushed it through that flatter terrain. 
Note on the right, left-hand side, it's a little bit of a road. The fire actually jumped that road, but since it was well within the burn unit, it was not a factor. It burned another acre or two and, and hit a different fuel type, and the continuity of fuel died down, and the fire went out. On this flank of the fire, you'll see the slope drop off, and the fire hits that break in the topography and does not and will not back down the hillside. So that flank of the fire basically ended up right where this video left off, right at the, the break of that topography there. Here's a little clip using a road as your control line, burning in some chemise, coyote brush, and a little and a little bit of manzanita. It's primarily manzanita here in this picture. Post burn. In the pictures here to the right, you'll notice good consumption of vegetation, leaving unburned areas of shelter habitat. Uh, the lower right picture, you'll see the example of that good consumption of the fuel. You'll see a little bit of the grass fuels off of it that burned. And then in the background of the picture, you'll see some manzanita, which goes into some oak woodland with little firs and left a nice little shelter belt there for habitat. The upper left picture, good consumption of your brush fuels, but you'll also notice conifers were affected also. And that was part of the objective was to knock back some of the conifer encroachment on these burn units. The lower left photo shows primarily chemise brush. Fire burned to the top of a ridge where a small dozer line was. You got a good mosaic. You still have patches of unburned fuel in there. And again, no fire progression downhill, and that's one of the big factors. You don't have to worry about having 100% control lines all the way around your burn units when you're burning in chaparral fuels during the time window that we've discussed, which is November through April, or maybe a little later, maybe a little earlier, depending on the conditions. Fire does not back downhill, and if there is a little bit of heavier down dead litter, if you get in some fir trees or oak woodland, it'll back, back down a little ways and then skunks out, doesn't cross drainages, and stops at the top of the ridge. A little post-burn burn continue. Pictured here is a burn conducted in December of 2018. It was about eight days of dry on this one. A storm was going to be coming, had just light winds. This was all hand burned and in, in some brush that hadn't burned since 2007. Got a fairly decent mosaic burn in it. There's no control lines. Burn right to the top of the ridge. On the north slope is some live oak, a little bit of tan oak. The plan will be to later go in next year, burn up the remaining fuel in there, and then you'll end up with some une uneven aged fuels, um, good for the habitat and good for the fuel reduction. The rest of the unburned fuel you see in the picture is also part of the burn unit, will be also targeted in the coming years. Say, so what are the, some of the rules of thumb? I always plan on burning between November through April. This lessens the need for a lot of equipment, lessens the need for folks to stay out there all night. It lessens the need for mop up, makes patrolling it very easy. Most of the time you're gonna be going home that night, be a little bit of residual smoke by that night and that morning, be no, more, no smoke left. Another rule of thumb between November and April, is to allow a minimum of 10 days without precipitation. That seems to be his work the best. More days is better. If you can get a 14 or 20 day stretch of dry weather in between storms, that's even better. With a longer exposure of solar radiation during April, as the days get longer, you can burn with five or six days of no precip. But again, the more days of dry weather, the better. I would not even worry about starting to burn no matter what time of the year, until 12 p.m. or later. Lower the humidity, the better, but still can burn with 50 to 60%, especially if you get a, a fairly decent little wind on it. Don't get locked in to burn in one burn unit. If you do not have the conditions and you're not getting the objective you need on the, on the burn that you're, you're attempting, move to another burn unit. Move to one that's got more slope. Or move to one that's lined up with the winds, depending on the wind forecast for that day. 
Another thing to do is keep records of conditions and your success. This will build those slides that you, that you can use and the experience for when you're out there burning. Okay, in summary, burning in chaparral can be one of the safest fuels to burn. Why do I say that? Because during the, the months of November through April, as I showed you in those slides, you get no downhill progression of fire, you get good fire behavior, good consumption of fuels. The fuel burns out when it hits a different topography, hits a different fuel type or, or continuity of fuel, the chaparral fuels go out. There's little to no mop up and patrol needed. So you don't have to, have to um, abuse a bunch of people. Burning in the chaparral fuels during that time of year is a, probably one of the best ways to treat many acres of vegetation. If you were to try to do this, treat that type of acreage in that kind of topography and fuel types with mechanical means, you'd be a huge heavy imprint on the land. And what I'm talking about is the use of dozers or excavators with mask masticators. Fire is natural and there's no impact, no, no big footprint on the land. You can burn in the late summer and early fall, but holding the fire along with mop up and patrol become an issue. It takes a lot of resources, a lot of fire engines, a lot of equipment um, to make that happen. And late fall, early summer is usually a peak fire season. And in the last number of years, California has been inundated with some fires and, and having the time, ability to burn during the early fall, late summer is becoming increasingly difficult in California. Again, it's all about conditions. If October gives the, the conditions and the forecasts are right, and you've had some rain, had some cool weather, then by all means, give it a shot. 